Have you seen others or yourself push through personal pain and trauma while engaging in advocacy for the health of the church without being given the tools to manage your or their own emotional wellness? If you're someone who has spent time using your resources in the spiritual abuse resistance world and have regularly felt overwhelmed, exhausted, and activated, I hope you listen. Lorianne Thompson joins me today and tells us who told her that trauma couldn't be her entire life. And we talk about one of the biggest challenges to those of us who sit in this space. This is going to be a great episode. I'm Amy Fritz, and you're listening to the Untangled Faith Podcast, a podcast for anyone who has found themselves confused or disillusioned in their faith journey. If you want to hold on to your faith while untangling it from all that is not good or true, this is the place for you. It's been on your to-do list for a while and you keep pushing it off for later. Today is a good day to tackle that bullet item. I'm talking about finding a counselor. If you've been considering getting started with counseling, faithful counseling makes it so easy to get started. I know you don't like talking on the phone, so it's good news that you can start the process without even picking up the phone to talk to someone. The Untangled Faith podcast is brought to you by my listeners who support me on Patreon. It is also brought to you by Faithful Counseling. Faithful Counseling is a Christian counseling service with more than 3,000 licensed therapists across all 50 states with access by video or phone sessions or chat or text. They're therapists with expertise in trauma, depression, family conflicts, and more. You can ask for a new counselor at any time, and financial aid is available for those who qualify. Untangled Faith podcast listeners get 10% off their first month from our sponsor, Faithful Counseling. Go to faithfulcounseling.com slash untangled. Fill out a questionnaire, and you'll be matched with a counselor. That's faithfulcounseling.com slash untangled. Before we get into the show, I want to remind you that the second anniversary of the show is this month, and I would love your help. If you have a question you would like for me to answer on the show, go to untangledfaithpodcast.com slash anniversary, and there's a form you can fill out that sends your question straight to me. There's a link in the show notes if you need one. I first heard Lori Ann Thompson's name about seven years ago. Since first reading about Lori Ann, I've come to know her as a real person who is more than the worst things that she has survived. I'm so honored to consider her a friend, and I'm grateful for this conversation we had. I wanted to give Lori Ann a chance to introduce herself in her own words before we get into the meat of this episode about surviving, healing, and the pitfalls of advocacy in the church abuse world. I also want to give you a heads up that Lori Ann and I keep talking in some bonus audio I'm sharing with the Patreon community. We have a really candid conversation about our relationship with social media and her decision to leave Twitter. I'd love for you to listen to that, to join us on Patreon and access that conversation, as well as a lot of other bonus content. Go to patreon.com slash untangled faith. That's patreon.com slash untangled faith. Here's my conversation with Lori Ann Thompson. Who is Lori Ann Thompson? Yeah. You wrote, there's three words on your social media, survivor, storyteller, and student. But I want to hear in your own words, who is Lori Ann Thompson? I am, uh, oh gosh, I think defining yourself is difficult and I, I hate boxes and I, I don't like to move forward with myself in, in terms of my credentials. I, um, the best and most important thing that I think that I am is uh, a wife and a mom. Uh, and I'm happily, happily married to Brad for, I think for, this is our 18th year. And I'm in a blended family with uh, one child I got for free and three three I had to labor for. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I'm a registered kinesiologist by, by training and by trade. And I run a small private clinic uh, that I work in part-time. And I make a really mean carrot cake. I, I don't know. You know, cooking is a, is a love and a passion for me. So is eating. So there's that. Uh, so is movement. And so is people. I think I'm an introvert by nature, uh, an empath either by uh, by trauma training or disposition. I'm not really sure. Yeah. And uh, I am also a survivor of um, sexual violence and poly victimization across a lifespan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I really wanted you to be able to use your words to say who you are because it's, I think, in the space of people that have had the Venn diagram overlapping with. Uh, abuse, uh, physical abuse, sexual violence, 
you know, all the things. It can be easy to become uh, defined by the worst thing. Mm -hmm. And who wants that attached to them? Not me. Nobody signs up for that. And so I just thought I really wanted you to be able to say who you are. And carrot cake on the list makes me really happy. (laughs) (laughs) It's humanizing, right? Like you were a real person. I am a real person. Yeah. You are a real human person with yeah. real family yeah. who bakes carrot cake and has a real life and yes. isn't just a talking point for people. And I think it's important for people to know that. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Uh, even saying that makes me feel misty. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that um, abuse and trauma is so profoundly dehumanizing. Yeah. And uh, in many ways, advocacy can be the same. Mm. especially public advocacy. Uh, and so we we become our trauma and we're not. Mm. And uh, we become defined by that and we ought not be. And um, it can be really difficult to reintegrate life before and life after. For me, there wasn't, um, there was never a time when abuse wasn't uh, part of my narrative. Um, but there was a time where I was, had what I would have considered a stable, stable safe and relatively happy life. And then an, is re-victimized. And so trying to coagulate back together or integrate back together who you were or thought you were with trauma and then who you are now uh, is a complex and interesting process. And I think that's one of the things we're going to talk about. Not long ago, um, my friend Janai asked me, and I was like in a particularly angsty time in this spiritual abuse world, um, Mm -hmm you know, and you see all the things and it just can get overwhelming and my own responses and the own, my own feelings that were like inside of me. And she just said, do you like who you are becoming? Mm-hmm. And it was such a powerful question to me. And I think it's really important for us to ask that question for those of us that care about people that have been harmed, mm-hmm. particularly in faith environments, because it's, it's a worthy cause. Um mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But along the way, the way we move and live in these spaces forms us. Mm -hmm. And we do have some choices in how we handle entering into and retreating from some of these spaces. And I just wonder, how have you experienced that personally for better or worse? What have you learned that you (laughs) would like to share? Um, This could probably be a whole month of podcasts. (laughs) Oh, who are gosh. we becoming and what have you learned from like living and moving in these spaces? Wow. I know you are a thinker and like to think through your answer. So take whatever yeah. time you need no. to think about it. Thank you. I am um, sort of jumping right in, isn't it? When abuse mars who you are, it fractures it. It deforms it, actually. Trauma, abuse, abuse of all sorts. Victimization, label it however you want to, whatever seems to fit what is what has occurred. And it causes you to question who you are, what you thought, what you understood about yourself, the world around you. Um, your entire worldview is altered and changed. In fact, it, it, there's evidence to suggest that your DNA is changed by trauma. Um, and so the expression of who we are is uh, very often highly shattered and fragmented and, and, um, and disordered even. And so the recovery process, and, and you know, I've talked to, about this on a couple of spaces that I've been privileged or invited into, uh, um, is a sort of a three-tiered or three-stepped continuum. And the first step of recovery, and you didn't ask this, but in order to answer it, I got to go through this to get, get there, is um, establishing safety and stability. This is from the work of Judith Herman. And <clears throat> is establishing safety and stability in the present. That's physical safety, emotional safety, spiritual safety, um, so that the harm will not continue, whatever that is. And it's not just, you know, can I go in behind my, you know, in my bedroom and lock my door? Am I am I physically safe? It's also, am I safe on social media? Am, am I safe emotionally where I don't have to interact with people I don't I don't know how to interact with yet, or I can't handle interacting with. Am I safe from my offender and the influences in that network, those sorts of things, and establishing safety and stability? Am I safe for myself? 
Mm, yeah. My, is my family safe? Is, am I safe in my family unit? Because trauma usually upends uh, the entire family unit. And that can take that can take a long time to establish safety and stability. I think that people try to move forward into advocacy in a public way before they're even safe and stable. And I think that's mm-hmm. really, uh, I think that's really a way that we can re-victimize ourselves as uh, survivors. And it certainly is a way that we can destabilize others unintentionally. And then in the second phase of uh, recovery that Dr. Herman talks about is grieving and remembering, mourning. And how mourning is it? Mourning who you were, mourning what's happened, mourning that this is the world that we live in. Yeah. Mourning the systems, mourning the structures, mourning the losses, mourning the the things that were, the things that weren't, the things that now will never be. Yeah. Um, and those, and you can fill in the blank with hundreds, if not thousands, of costs that come. The things that need to be mourned, and oftentimes that's a therapeutic process involving um, a helper, hopefully somebody who's registered and accountable to an organization. Um, but it can also involve a therapeutic community, like the survivor community, and and I think we can be good at helping each other grieve, mourn, remember, and validating. Uh, validating our experiences. And the goal here is sort of the goal of grieving and remembering is to restore a sense of agency and mm-hmm. to diminish the terror and the of submission of having to submit, whether it's spiritually, sexually, physically, financially, um, you name it. There's all sorts of dominance and submission that come into, into abuse and tyranny. Um, but the whole goal of grieving and remembering is to name those experiences, to, to grieve those experiences, to label them, to assign shame as the perpetrator, not the victim. And then also the whole goal of that time frame is actually empowerment, right? Is to take back power from those who stole it and return it to the person your own person, your own human, your own dignified individual, and restore that sense of agency that you can actually affect change in your own life. You know, you can do the things of life, yeah. and and re and recover. And the third phase of recovery is um, is actually reintegration back into who you, who you were and who you are now. And um, we often think that mourning will never end. (laughs) It'll always be in this intense therapeutic process. And and that's actually not accurate. Uh, It feels like that at the time, but mourning does come to an end. And moving into an expansion and deepening of relationships does occur with yourself and with others. And, and, And in reintegration, there's new possibilities in life. There's new podcasts. Yes. Okay. <laughs> new conversations. Yes. New conversations to be had, new relationships to be formed, um, and new possibilities in life. And then the, the fourth thing that Dr. Herman has recently talked about in her new book on uh, truth and repair is justice. And so as a fourth phase. And, and I think justice is actually intermingled through all the other phases. And that's where, um, you know, trauma is a social problem and it needs a social solution Ooh, but, yeah um, yeah so and this is part of the social solution you know? yeah i um i would say that that we need to be careful not to take our pain and um move move it rapidly through the phases of recovery and move right into reintegration okay that hurt yes. yeah it, it sucked um yeah and now i have a story to tell uh, without having done the deep and hard and wide and vast work of establishing and keeping safety, not just yeah. establishing it once, it's not a one-time deal, and mourning, remembering, and grieving, and meaning-making, yeah. um, so that you know who you are in, and you know how you got there, and that's not to victim blame in any way, but you know the pieces of your own puzzle that make you vulnerable in, in those situations. Yeah. To be human is to be vulnerable, but we, also, we all must understand our own vulnerabilities, understanding where we have power and how would we use that. You know, offenders are people who very often feel very powerless, but they exert extend, um, extensive power and they, they do so in a really destructive way. You, and then we talk about justice and, and, and what does justice look like? Yeah, and and how can we partner with ourselves and other people to bring about justice? And I don't think that we define that well. And as we're moving through the traumatic process, 
And as I've moved through that traumatic process, and that, I mean, I think that this is year eight for us, and I have learned things the very, 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 very hard way. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I am a reader, and so as I was moving through what was uh, for us a catastrophic event and series of events that was protracted over a long period of time, um, I did find in, in, the, in the faith space, in, in the religious space, there wasn't much in the way of resources. Yeah. Um, at the time. Now that has gladly changed. You know, yeah. That's only in an eight year sphere. Um, you know, Jules Woodson took it on the chin first and, and went forward in that faith sphere. Um, we, our events predated her. So then since then, and uh, Emily Joy and her um, companion that came forward also exploded that, that, that space. And they, they spread around courage to be shared yeah. uh, encourages the best contagion. I just wanted to frame our conversation in that context because yeah, I think I like it's that. I think it's really difficult to talk about where do we want to go from here if we don't mm-hmm. know that there's a there's a foundation that needs to be built in order to even be here in the first place. Yeah, Lorianne, have you found that that's a linear process or kind of like the grief thing where you're kind of they kind of blend in and you move back and forth now mm-hmm. and then. Mm-hmm. I, I'm a pretty linear person, believe it or not. I have found that the, the that while it's not a linear process, it's a pretty predictable process. Sure. So uh, if I'm if I say I'm in that reintegration phase now and I hit something where I need to grieve and remember, then that will be destabilizing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it helps me to be like, okay, okay, okay. I gained ground before. I can, I know the things that will help me gain yeah. stability. I know what grieving and remembering looks like. I can do this and I'm not going to die in the process. Yeah. And, and I can, re- in, in time, I can process this and reintegrate um, this new meaning making, this new mourning back into who I currently am now. And it doesn't any longer have to consume me. I remember talking, I had one, one initial conversation with Dr. Diane Langberg years ago. Uh, and I can't remember if it was on email. There was only one in-person, like sort of virtual conversation. And she said, well, trauma can't be your whole life. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what? What are you what talking you about? It is my whole life. I just don't, I don't even have a life. And, yeah, and yeah. that she was right, but I didn't have a framework to package what she was yeah. saying. Yeah. I was I was definitely not stable and not safe. And it would stay that way for a long time. So I couldn't even fathom what she mm-hmm. might have meant to not have this be so um, carnivorous and all consuming. And I wonder if that something happening to be like, oh, I am destabilized. I'm confused now. Is just a sign that, and feeling activated again. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, there's something, maybe I still, there's something I've worked through a lot. Yes. You know, I've done like the certain percentage, yeah. but there's this part I didn't see. Yes. And this yeah. part is activating me. And I, I think I see... A lot of that, I've seen it in myself and a lot Mm. of people in the spiritual abuse awareness community um, of like a chronic activation, being chronically activated. Oh, man. Speak Mm -hmm. to what you see that and how that has been like harmful in your own personal life and kind of what you have seen and the compassion you Mm -hmm. have for others that seem to to be getting sucked into being chronically activated. Right. I knew you were going to go there. And so I, that's why I knew you were going there. Uh, it's hard because you give me some heads up. And so thank you, for first of all, for going there. I think it's actually a very brave conversation to have. It's a brave question to ask. Um, because the last thing that, why, that anybody wants to do with any kind of, um, even the most marginal interest or background in abuse and advocacy is to squelch anyone's voice or give anybody any sort of mandate to follow. However, we can we can offer information and we can offer our own experience coupled with evidence and uh, allow people to make informed decisions. Yes. I think that one of the things that can come out of um, survivorship is a survivor mission, right? Uh, we want a meaning make from our suffering and we want it to mean something, damn it. Yes. Right. And so we want it to be redeemed. We want it. We want to be able to help other people or give people what we did not have or what we wish we had have had in our own circumstances. And we can do that in a way 
that is deeply destabilizing, deeply activating, and, um, and in many ways continually keeps our nervous system aflame. And we can tell ourselves that, that we're doing good when we're actually doing ourselves harm. And so the very first and most important person to advocate for, to care for, to stabilize, to make meaning with, to commune with, to recover is actually yourself. Mm. That doesn't feel like the evangelical way. <laughs> and, and, and roll that together. And I was thinking about this as I was trying to tidy my hair for our conversation today. Um, roll that together with the misogyny of Christendom, with the, uh, the living sacrifice, <laughs> crawling yourself on the altar and like plunging the knife into your own heart yeah. uh, so that God can use you and slant, you know, you, and being witness to your own repeated crucifixion. Um, you know, there is only one sacrificial live and we are not it. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, if, if for those of, of us who, are, who ascribe to Christendom where we are not Christ. And so the very first and, and, you know, two important things that, uh, our our Lord said, "Love your neighbor as you love yourself." Oh, wait a minute, hold on. Love your neighbor as you love your self. self. Both. And so, um, what does it mean to truly love yourself? Now, for a quick break. Now, back to the show. I do appreciate you saying the struggle, sharing the struggle, though, and moving out of one space. Did it take away your? Have you found a, a way and a rhythm that is more sustainable for you to encourage others while mm-hmm. still being Lori Ann? <laughs> well, the thing the about the person that makes cake, yeah. <laughs> and drives her kids places. <laughs> exactly. I'm still the Thompson taxi. Um, I think the, the, yes, I have. And when I went to grad school, you know, I, I can't even remember how much that cost, but it was an enormous amount of money and time and investment. And you want to justify, I, I learned all this. I paid all this. I, I need to use this. Um, and ultimately, uh, when I was coming into grad school, I had to decide whether I would go back to my former profession as a kinesiologist or whether I would go full time into advocacy. And I going full time into advocacy looked like staring down a barrel of a gun. I knew I would never I would always be activated. I knew that that I would always I knew I'd be good at it, uh, but I knew that it would kill me, like literally. And so I made the decision to return to my former very holistic, uh, highly embodied profession where I work with the human body, with with my clients, and it also has improved my health. I feel uh, uh, like I am a much more vital human being. I can I can move around again instead of feel like I'm being curled up into a ball in a corner. Um, and it's a way to give. There's all kinds of ways to give back to the universe, good back into the universe. It doesn't always have to look like being involved with highly traumatic, highly activating things. But I do work for a lawyer. I do contract work for an abuse lawyer and I meet with survivors uh, and do their intake, which means that people who are exploring what their legal options are to deal with their abusive situation. Uh, I'm, I'm one of the, one of the first doors that they come through and one, and I ask questions that are outlined by, by the, by the litigator. And that helps prepare the, the lawyer for meeting with that survivor, but it's also bringing people into the vestibule out of victimization mm-hmm. and into into survivorship and it helps them to be heard and listening is an intervention and listening as dr judith herman says is a radical act and so i can do that on my own time and uh i can schedule it when i have the like the yeah the wellspring to give and uh and and it also helps me to feel like i'm still giving back to to our survivor community in a way that's sustainable for me that's beautiful I, yeah i love it i sit with the most the be literally the most courageous people on the face of the earth so it's a for me it's a beautiful balance um and uh i feel really confident that now although it was a very difficult decision to make that i made the right decision yeah and you don't have to have your name out there in lights saying, here's the one you get to just yeah. put in a few hours being a listener mm-hmm. and somebody that knows some of the, the pitfalls and the things yeah. to avoid and 
handling people in some of the most scary times of their life. And yeah. but you don't always but you don't have to have all of the arrows being <laughs> flying right. your way that exactly. happens yeah. in the public advocacy space or the exactly. public like existing. Even yeah. Space, yeah. So can I can I tell you a story that yes. impacted me? I would love to you to hear. I would love to hear a story from you. I am originally from the east coast of Canada. I'm from a province called Nova Scotia. And as as maybe some of your listeners might know, I was poly victimized as a child. I grew up in a really toxic home. Um, sexual abuse, alcoholism, mental health issues, incarceration, physical abuse, uh, divorce and separation. I think my ACE score, which is an um, adverse childhood experience score, can be on, on from zero to 10, 10 being the highest, zero being the lowest. And um, ever the perfectionist, mine was a 10. Um, and when I was growing up and my uh, we were in a really difficult space, which we always were, uh, there was a case that came forward where a man was um, really mutilating his wife in, in Nova Scotia. He was abusing her, his name was Billy uh, and his his wife murdered him. He was going to murder her son and he came home drunk and uh, she shot him in, in the pickup truck. And uh, this case, and I, I remember it being on the news and then there was sort of books about it and uh, about this this measure of violence. And they, this woman, they didn't want to um, incarcerate her. Uh, she was actually let go at first and then the, the Crown... Uh, eventually did incarcerate her, I think, for three months. And she, when she left that situation and when she left prison, she became a staunch advocate for um, domestic violence. She spent 10 years traveling um, the country, the province, the country, and probably in some places the world discussing domestic violence. And uh, 10 years after uh, her then um, common-law husband was dead, she shot herself. Mm. She impacted so many people's lives except her own. Mm. Wow. It was, it, it was profoundly impacting to me when I later revisited the story after my own coming to in, in my early 40s, victim, re-victimization and coming to. And I thought, yep, that's what we do. You can see and that. That's what we do. We pay such a, such a high price to help other people that, you know, I don't want to end up in a car in the Halifax waterfront with my, you know, a hole in my head. Mm. Um, I can't end up. That would not be a just outcome, would it? No. And not that I wasn't suicidal. I don't mean that. I just mean that's the pathway. You can see the trajectory. Yeah. Yeah. That's the pathway to consistently ignoring your own need for safety, stability, grieving, mourning, and a reintegration into a life worth living. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. listening to stories is traumatic too. It is. And sitting with others. I just talked with a mutual friend, Pete Singer. Mm -hmm. He's just a gracious person. And he was mm -hmm. talking about how they have realized at Grace the importance of providing care mm -hmm. for everyone involved in the processes that they walk through, investigations and all the things mm -hmm. on all sides of the questioning, the interviewers, the interviewees, because he realized and had seen the, the studies of people walking around with secondary trauma too after their own and how devastating that can be. And so we, I believe we give lip service to self-care in the advocacy community. I have yet to see that, that actually bear itself out in, in, in any of the circles. I really, I really have yet to see it. Yeah. And, and I've watched carefully. And so uh, I haven't left the advocacy community uh, well, that's not true. I have left the advocacy community. I haven't left the survivor community. Mm. What's the difference, please? I, that's a very specific use of word. And I think it's it's important. A small group of survivors become advocates and they do so. They do so, I think, and some for some people can do that and do that really, really well. I do think it, it does require a lot of therapy and a lot of grounding and a lot of process and a lot of um, self-awareness uh, and a lot of sort of balancing. Because the reality is, is if you're a survivor, you carry what's called a high, high allostatic load. So your your physiology is, is amped up. Yeah. Um, 
all the time. And so when you deal with trauma, it amps it up some more. And so where are you going to, there has to be that balance between um, rest, recreation, recovery. And, and I don't see a lot of people doing a lot of balance. I mm. see a lot of people talking about it, but I don't see a lot of people doing it. There is a threshold where we step over, where we, where we are no longer just survivors. We become people who are advocates for others. I think there's a sense in which most survivors think, well, everybody does that. Because they're because the people who are become advocates for others are the ones that have the perhaps the loudest voices on social media or are the ones talking in, to the news or or being quoted or hosting conferences, etc. The vast majority of survivors don't do that. The vast majority of survivors don't become advocates. The vast majority of survivors go back to their jobs, they continue on with their lives, they recover and they reintegrate back into society. And we'll never know their names. And the vast majority of survivors prefer it that way. I have seen in the advocacy community the same grasping for power, Mm -hmm. the same need for a name, the same desire for a platform that I see in the abusive community. Mm -hmm. And that is just not, we cannot bring liberation with oppressive tactics. Yeah. And so it's a, a game I refuse to play. Oh man, that reminds me, I had just listened to a conversation on the podcast, The Bulletin. Um, Mike Cosper is, does this podcast generally with Russell Moore. It's a Christianity Today podcast, but Russell Moore was gone. David French was on with him and they were talking about the recent um, CPAC conference, which is a, an American like conservative political action thing. And that um, former president Trump had spoken And he had said, I'm going to read what he said in 2016. He said, in 2016, I declared, I am your voice. Today, I add, I am your warrior. I am your justice. And for those who have been wronged and betrayed, I am your retribution. That was, that was, who who said that? That was former president Donald Trump to all these conservative people that have felt marginalized. He's speaking to them. And I thought, you know, Mike and David talked about this and and said, isn't it interesting that so many have embraced this idea of, I have been wronged, I have not been listened to, and this person Mm -hmm. is going to be like a a desire for vindication and retribution where there's some, there's a little bit of holy desire for that, Mm -hmm. that justice desire that we have. But here in the U S we've seen politically, um, you know, the most important characterization of our, of our political parties is what we are against Mm -hmm. what we hate. And that has Mm -hmm. become the most defining thing about American Republicans and American Democrats. And Mm -hmm. I do not want that to be how that defines us as believers and followers of Jesus, particularly those who claim to and really do care for those mm-hmm. who have been harmed in their faith communities. Mm-hmm. I have seen us, myself included, I cannot just say it's out there, sliding towards becoming all about what we are against. Correct. Yeah. Have you seen yeah. that? Any yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah, it's really it's really unfortunate. It's also really common. So, um, so you spoke about a couple of things. One, you talked about sort of revenge, and revenge is something that, and I put posted this recently on Instagram. Revenge, revenge is a feeling or a desire for um, retribution based out of powerlessness, right? So it's, it's all the things you formulate in your mind that you're going to do or you're going to say when you have no capacity to do or say anything. And um, revenge is a desire that really fades away when you have the capacity to say and do things again. You know, for instance, I'll, I'll pay you back. I'll, I'll let everybody know all the bad things about you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to smear you all over the face of the universe. Uh, well, that becomes like a, almost a disgusting and vile thing to do when you are free to do it. Mm-hmm. And for those of us who, who have done it or, or do it uh, in the public sphere, I think we tell ourselves we like it. Um, I think we, we think, oh, yeah, this, I'm getting him back. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm going to let the world know what a, 
insert adjective uh, individual he is. And I, what that ends up doing is, is um, really centering your life moving forward uh, on your offender as opposed to on yourself. So that's, that's problematic. And um, it's a red flag for me. And I'm being really honest. I'm pretending like you and I are in, a, in, my, in my study having a cup of tea. Yeah, it's a red flag yeah. for me when people lead with either their credentials as their identity or when they lead with their trauma as their identity. Okay. So that's said with love and compassion. Yes. Yes. Okay. Not, not judgment. Um, but it always makes me stand back and go, it helps me know where they are right? in, in their, in their process or who, who they feel they are right now. Because I want to say to you and them, don't you know, you're so much more mm-hmm. than your letters. And don't you know, you're so much more than what he did to you. You were made to thrive, not just to survive. Yes. And so when we define ourselves by what we've accomplished or what's being done to us, then we don't get the opportunity to flourish into the fullness of who we are. And we actually don't even have to define who we are now. We're defined by what happened to us and what we've accomplished. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I think as as a survivor community, we do need a survivor mission, a survivor agenda. What kind of equality or equal community do we want to cultivate? And what is that going to look like in our lives? Where is it going to be? Where is it going to be mutuality? Yeah. Where does Amy come to my house and we have dinner? Where do we have sort of the right of access to each other's um, beautiful lives? Where can we talk about um, the good things that are happening in our lives? Where can we cultivate fairness, peace, mutuality, reciprocity, cooperation, uh, e- equity, Uh, and and you know i think we in the advocacy community community we can have a situation where we elevate um, people into dominance and then we end up walking beneath them in submission Mm -hmm. and there is no recovery in that paradigm there is none because somebody else always has more power i'm giving my power away to you i will submit to what you think what you feel Etc. And I will define myself by who you say I am. I am. Mm-hmm. I am a survivor. I am. I'm all. I am good because you say I'm good. Uh, I'm not. I'm not good because of my inherent worth as a human being. And 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 so therefore my worth is still put out there for somebody good to say I'm good. You know. We have to yeah. define not only who we are outside of trauma and integrate trauma into that picture, but we also have to define. What is our life now going to be about? And that's a costly process. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Am I about just looking at the ugly all the time? That does not sound sustainable. It's not. In that conversation that um, Mike and David had, Mike Cusper had mentioned this, um, this, this reference to Isaiah um, chapter 30, verse 15. And this is, Uh, This is the verse. This is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, in repentance and rest is your salvation, Mm -hmm. in quietness and trust is your strength. And at the end of that verse, but you will have none of it. Exactly. Verse 16, you said, no, I will flee on horses. Therefore you will flee. It's that wanting to do the thing. Yeah. Rest is, you have to work for it. That's to be an intentional thing. Yeah. Quietness and rest. That yeah. does not sound like holy work. Yeah. But you're arguing that it is. I I I'm confident that it is. Yeah. I'm confident it's holy work. In I when I left social media, when I left Twitter, I thought nobody would ever talk to me again. <laughs> Here we are. Um and I thought, okay, okay, if nobody talks to me again, am I gonna be okay? And I decided, yeah, um, I'm going to be okay. You know, I, if, if I've done all I can do in this space and there's never more for me to do, then okay. But I've actually found that um, like, like people like you who reach out, and I've said yes to everybody uh, because it comes in little driggles and drabs, things that I can handle. Um, has been deeply rewarding and, and I feel like when 
when people people like you and others come they they come to a person who doesn't have it all together but has has something to give out of an overflow as opposed to a deficit and fellow fellow students who say look at look at this thing i've learned from somebody else yeah. <laughs> from jesus <laughs> <laughs> it's not pointing to Lori Ann. It's pointing to, no. uh, it's pointing to like, and I want to share. I want everyone to have access to the thing, and then we can yeah. be together, like you said, not you here and somebody else here, but like, you know, the holding hands. Yeah. Um. You just different places on the path sometimes, and be like, look sure. at this beautiful view I found right here. Yeah. Yeah. Look and at this beautiful spot. Yeah. 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 Look at this place where we could pull, we could, we could pull off the side of the path and yeah. just look yeah. together. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, like I think that. it's a, that's a vision of what do we want to be? Yeah. As opposed to what do we want to destroy? Yeah. How do we become, how do we avoid becoming what we're against, Lorianne? I think it's hard. I think it's really hard. I think I think that if we do not do our own deep work, we will become the exact thing that we are. We say we survived. Are there red flags to look for? Massive red flags. Would you like a list? I would like however many on the list you want to give. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a list girl too. I love lists. Um, anyone who tells you what to do. Mm. Anyone who gives advice. Rather than information, you said, "Well, I give advice. I don't. I don't give advice. I give information." Uh, anyone the difference who, is the agency okay. is on the listener. That's right. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, so people in your situation have done X, Y, or Z, um, and you know, you may have other options available to you. These are your yeah. options. You're going to have to make a decision. I, I have found at, at points in my journey, I wanted somebody to decide for me. The very, yeah. very, very wise people did not. Was it in the end when someone decides for us and something goes badly, we just are mad at them again right. and ourselves. Right. Yeah. Yes. Because they, they, we trusted them to be our our guidance when in, in fact we actually empowerment is developing our own internal guidance anybody who who seems busier than is humanly possible um, anybody who talks about valuing their health and well-being but does not demonstrate the practices of health and well-being like mm. staying connected to their important attachments whether that's a partner or you know their their family, their chosen family or their family of origin, whatever. Um, anybody who travels all the time and, and does not seem to be rooted and grounded in anything. It's hard to be known. It's hard to be known if you are always traveling. Mm -hmm. Right. It's hard to be known by um, the people. If you're talking about your relationships more than doing your relationships, that's a problem. Um, I said earlier in the podcast, anyone who leads with their credentials is always... Always a threat to me. You're gonna to have to do a lot to to like make up for that with Lorian. Is what you're saying? If you start with that, there's gonna to have to be something else that redeems you later on. That's not you what's gonna impress yeah. you. Yeah. yeah, no, because I I'll, I I highly and I highly value education, mm -hmm. um, and academia. I highly value it, but uh, I think it just it can show that see, I know more than you know, mm -hmm. and and then in fact, as a survivor. Uh, and as a as somebody who wants to help empower other people, it's not about what I know. It's actually about what you know, mm -hmm. and what what information we can share um, to help you help you get what you need to move forward. No, yeah. I don't. I don't need you to look up to me. I want I want us to move along together. Mm -hmm. right. um, anybody who asks for money. Um, I just, I know it sounds really stupid, but anybody who asks for money or um, makes you feel like you can't say no to them uh, for whatever reason, mm -hmm. anybody who, who, when you question them, does not give you a proper answer. Yeah. No clear answer. Yeah. Skirts it, you know, questions the question, uh, somehow makes you feel like the question isn't valid. Anybody who does, doesn't seem to be doing their own their own work and anybody who seems to pretend or give off airs that they are somehow less than human. Mm -hmm. um, and anybody who makes you take a seat 
uh, anybody who doesn't defer to your own humanity. I, I, yeah. We are meant to defer to each other. And yeah. I'm, I'm hearing you say these red flags and I'm, I just, I'm going to say like for my own self, this is a red flag. These are red flags I need to think about if I'm waving them myself in someone else's face. Mm, and I know. A red flag in my own life that says, oh, did I feel like I needed to impose my help on someone? Mm-hmm. Right. 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 Yeah. Um, did I neglect all the things I needed to do really mm-hmm. to point out how wrong people were on social media? <laughs> right. right. Um, I just talked to Becky Castle Miller um, oh, she's this wonderful. for this week's, and she's doing her PhD on mm-hmm. emotions in Luke and theology. Mm-hmm. And we mm-hmm. had a wonderful conversation. I had asked her some things about discipleship, things that people maybe get wrong. And she said that being over involved can be a trauma response. Mm-hmm. It blew my mind, yes. Lori Ann. Yes. This happens. Yes so much in communities of people that have felt harmed have yes. seen the light have found a little bit of humor uh, not humor oh, i probably found humor but some healing and now they're like i am going to do all the things all the things and i'm going to be everywhere anybody who's everywhere yes. if you are everywhere you can't be somewhere it, it, it spoke to me because i'm the person yeah. that thinks you will love me if i show up and do all the things yeah. and that is not Amy at her most healthy. No, and it's it's also it's also not loving your neighbor as you love your self. Yeah, imposing demands on your own um, frame that you would you would not consider healthy for anybody else. Yeah, what has a sustainable rhythm looked like for you? So as we wrap up this conversation, mm-hmm. just I know that your life is different than other people's, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. what has been sustainable for you, mm-hmm. life giving? And in like investing in others, investing mm-hmm. in yourself, and just mm-hmm. seeing life and cultivating beauty and goodness. Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, the people I have admired the most are the people who have become beautiful despite the brutal. Right? And I, I, those people are my are my heroes, and. Um, some of them, you know your name, their name of, and some of them we don't. And I have decided through all of my own research that uh, I can't die young because I have children who don't need to be motherless. And I have a spouse who would be devastated if I was not present. Mm-hmm. And the first and most important thing that I do to be beautiful is to take care of my health. And I have learned the very, very hard way that I have to sleep. I have to eat and I have to move and that those things are the first thing that I have to go into my bucket of well-being uh, and then if there's anything I mean and then people have to work I get that my spouse is the breadwinner and I work part-time and so I'm able to keep that margin and I understand that that's an extraordinarily privileged place to be yeah. but I uh, that said I work part-time um, and then I have also found through trial and error, I can do approximately one, maybe two of these kinds of things um, a month. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Today, they happen to be in the same day. I I met with somebody before I met with Mm -hmm. you. But, um, and that that's um, as much, that's the pace of what I can handle. And that I can travel about once a quarter. And beyond that, um, that's, that's how I keep myself well. Um, I don't apologize for it. I used to. Um, I, I felt for a long time, oh my gosh, I'm not enough. I'm not enough. I'm not enough. I can't do enough. I can't know all the all the things yeah. I'm supposed to know. Uh, and I just decided, yeah, you know what? You have to let that go. Because at the end of your life, in your marginal decade, in my marginal decade, the last decade of our life, and whenever that is, you know, the survivor community will mourn me, but if I miss my husband and my children and myself, if there was never anything for anybody to draw on, including me, then I would have missed the entire point of being here. Yeah. So it sounds really simple, uh, but it's simplicity sometimes is the best. I like it. Uh, thank you. Thank you for, you know, inviting me into your your home <laughs> for a virtual 
cup of tea or coffee together. It has been life-giving for me. Mm. I am grateful and I'm grateful for the hard decisions that you made that give permission to others to rethink boundaries as well. Sometimes mm-hmm. when somebody goes first in mm-hmm. saying no to something, yeah, it makes the rest of us reevaluate yeah. whether we need to say yes to the, all the things, show up yeah. to all the things all the time. Yeah. And you weren't doing it out of needing to serve us. Right. But isn't that interesting that the overflow of sitting with Jesus in a sustainable life-giving mm-hmm. rhythm will just by its very nature produce that fruit, right? That other people are like, that sounds like rest. Yeah. That sounds like somewhere I can breathe mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I can be in for the long haul. I think when people have to look at their life and go, can I do this forever? And if the answer is no, then what do you need to change to be able to? Mm. And and to final your thought, you you said if when somebody says no, it gives other permission to people's other people permission to say no. And I would submit that there can be no yes if there's no no. Mm-hmm. It's not a real. It's not a real yes. Right. If you're compelled to to serve out of your survivor mission, your survivor agenda, um, or because you want to be a do-gooder, which most of us are, uh, then then there is no real no. You're actually not consenting to, to what you're doing. And you're not That's how I feel people. with you in this conversation, because I know that you would have said no mm-hmm. if it was not a good idea for you. Yes. Uh, because I've seen you do that. So I feel confident that you would mm-hmm. not have said yes to this right. if you did not have the margin and You're it right. wasn't a good thing for you at the time. It just feels, yeah. it just feels real. It feels real. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you so, so, so much. I'm absolutely positive you benefited from listening in on this conversation with Lorianne. I have a list of things to think about and pray about as I sit in this space of listening to and interacting with some things that are really heavy. To hear the rest of my conversation with Lori Ann, join me on Patreon. You can access that conversation as well as a lot of other bonus content at patreon.com slash untangled fade. If you're on social media, I would love to keep this conversation going over on Twitter or Instagram or through the Facebook page. I'm untangled faith on Instagram and Facebook and I'm faith untangled on Twitter. The Untangled Faith podcast is hosted and edited by me, Amy Fritz. This podcast is made possible by the support of my Patreon community. A special thanks to producers Michelle Pionic, Phil and Susan Perdue, Pam Forsyth, and Shelley Taylor. Thanks so much for listening. I'll see you next week.